Well, welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Martin with Silver Spring Town Center. We are so happy to have Carol Light and Ken Cantor talking about their adventure in Svalbard, Norway, and as they present polar bears, calving glaciers, and pack ice in the Norwegian high Arctic. So I put on an extra sweater because I'm getting a little chilly thinking about it already. It's, it's so wonderful to have you, you both here, Carol and Ken. I've been so excited about this program, let me tell you. <laughs> well, and also, we also advertised, usually with our travel logs, they are mini presentations, but this is a special big one. We may have time at the end if you wanted to share a rapid fire presentation. It would be six photos of one particular place in the world with rapid fire, um, six minute presentation talking about the place. But um, we are planning to spend the bulk of the time, if not all of it, on Carol and Ken's adventure. And we should have time at the end for Q&A. In the meantime, you're welcome to put your comments and questions in the chat. So take it away, Ken and Carol. OK. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Yes, and welcome, everybody. So far, we have 119 people on this presentation. I would like to give a special thanks to our tech helpers, Dave Snap, member of Silver Spring Village, Mira Cohen, my, our granddaughter, who hopefully is watching this from McGill University in Montreal, and most of all, Lisa Martin, who saw our pictures on Facebook and said, you've got to do this for Silver Spring Village. So here we are. Here we are. So um, let's start with saying the origins, talking about the origins of this journey. Um, one of the origins was a visit we had to Patagonia some years ago, in which we went to the southernmost town in on the uh, on the globe, which is Ushuaia in Argentina. And wouldn't it be nice to be at the northernmost town in the world? And Lisa, next slide. Lisa. Oh. Long Year Bien, Savarbard, the world's northernmost town at 78 degrees north. And if we could see the next slide. Uh, okay, so Lisa is outlining where Savarbard is. And right above that is the North Pole. We took this picture from our globe. And if you look to the west, you will see the northern latitude of Greenland. That's how far north we were. We were about 600 miles from the North Pole uh, when we're in Svalbard. And you can see, and Svalbard is governed and run by Norway. Uh, the, government, the government is a Norwegian government and the languages are predominantly English and Norwegian in Svalbard. And Longyearbyen is a city or a, no, a town no, a on the is an island exa exaggeration yes. on the island of Spitsbergen in the archipelago of Svalbard. So sometimes you see advertisements for trips to Spitsbergen, and that's the same thing. And in, in Long Year Bien, there are about 1,700 or so year round residents. Next slide, now, please. Um, and there is a history of coal mining. In fact, the name of the town, Long Year Bien, is, might sound like an American name to you. And in fact, it was an American, David Long Year, who in the early part of the 20th century came to this part of the world. And the, it was known that there was coal there. And, and he, um, he was an entrepreneur and opened up many, many coal mines in this, re in this region. And there were other coal mines run by other people, but the town got its name from him. The next slide shows remnants of the coal industry. Okay, so, so these are posts, there, there were lines between these when the coal came from the mines to the uh, port, they were carried by 
by wires and, and uh, material on, that were carried by these posts. And in the next slide, you will see the remnants of the coal. Next slide. Okay, so this, we're still at the port and there is still coal mining going on in, in uh, Svalbard to this, to this day. Although we heard when we were there that the last coal mine, I think there's only one, will be closed down this, uh, this, this year. And of the coal there now, about um, a third of it more or less is used locally in Long Year BN for the power plant to generate electricity and to provide uh, heat for, for the town that is kind of piped, and you'll see in a moment, is piped into the town as steam. And this is a view of the city, about 2,000 residents, most stay an average of about eight years. It's totally dark for four months of the year and totally light for four months of the year. There are more polar bears than people in town. Not in town. Not in town. In, in, and in Svalbard. In Svalbard. Yeah. And you might have heard of Svalbard as the home. Um, you might have heard of, of um, Svalbard as the home of the Doomsday Seed Vault, which stores the seeds of every known crop on the planet. Next slide, please. You can see this is another view of Long Year BN. And a few days after the first slide, snow started to fall on the mountains. And, and remember, we're about August, what, 16th or? August 17th, 18th. 17th. Yeah. And so we have snow on the mountains at that point. Next slide. And uh, <laughs> This is the northernmost gas station in the world. Um, the, the prices, uh, it's not a very large station. There are not a lot of cars there, but there are some. And the prices that you see there are in Norwegian kroner, um, which is about uh, one-tenth the price of a dollar. Um, gas was extremely expensive there, as it is. It's in 10 times the price of a dollar. And and these are in um, these are in uh, liters, right? Okay, so to go from kron kron to lead to dollars, you divide by ten. Okay, next slide. North Pole Expedition Museum. We spent three hours here. Took tons of pictures, which we will not show you, of lots of the expeditions which started from or ended up in Savarbard fascinating place. These are avalanche fences. So um, in 2015, Long Year Bien experienced one of the first major avalanches. This is the mountain in back of the town. And to um, inhibit the flow of the avalanche snow down the mountain, they erected these fences and, and they go way further up on the mountain. In fact, while we were there, there, were, there was a helicopter that was carrying the pieces of the fence uh, to, for further in, in, installation. Dropping them down on the mountain. Yeah, and so I'll just, just say that, that they hadn't had much of an avalanche danger because the quality of the snow has changed very rapidly. This is one of the most rapidly, places in the world where the temperature is most rapidly increasing. The quality of the snow has changed and now there is an avalanche danger in town. So they are erecting these fences. And someone asked how tall these fences are. We don't know. We didn't ask and we didn't get close enough to them. No. Next slide is a view of the harbor. And next slide, you can see us kayaking in the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, now Long Year Bien uh, is on a fjord and we cross the fjord uh, on this on this vessel. Uh, and we were wearing dry suits, which are very difficult to get in. They have, uh, they cover your feet and they cover your head, except for your face. We needed help getting into them. 
The water was probably about 30 degrees and the temperature was a little bit above that. Um, We were wearing probably as many clothes as we had. Um, When we kayaked to the other side of the fjord, we were served hot drinks. There was one other traveler um, with us and he was in a kayak with the guide. On the way back, it got pretty wavy and was raining and sleeting and quite the adventure. Yeah, so we got back. We, we stayed quite warm and comfortable, but we were pretty tired by the time we got back after this adventure. And happy to have the adventure. Another thing that we did um, in our few days in Long Year BN was next, to next go slide. on a fossil hike. Um, and I'll just talk about, there's our guide up on, up on the trail here. You might see a little stick or something sticking up from, from, up from her back. Um, this is a rifle. And why in the world, if you're going fossil hunting, would you have a rifle? Well, it turns out in Long Year BN, you are not allowed out of town without somebody who is registered and trained to carry a rifle in case there is a polar bear who is interested in you for not very friendly reasons. So so to to go outside of the town, you need to have uh, that kind of protection. And anybody who shoots a polar bear um, gets a criminal investigation to make sure they did everything they could to prevent that from happening. Okay, notice lots of rocks that have um, come down as the glacier has receded. And there are many fossils. There are many fossils um, in these rocks. We found one of the fossils. um, And you're allowed to keep them because there are so many fossils that come down as the avalanche recedes. And it is not a national park. (laughs) Right. Right. Okay. Next, we will see a pipeline. Okay. So there I am standing on a little bridge uh, that also holds the pipes carrying heat from the uh, power plant. And these pipes also carry water and sewage. Um, uh, And the reason that everything is above ground is because of the um, The ice, the permafrost, the permafrost there, uh, they can't put, they can't put pipes underground. And the pipes are heated. Yeah, the pipes are heated. And you see them throughout the town. Okay, so after three days in Long Year BN, we boarded a ship to go around the archipelago. And on this ship were 110 passengers 29 of us were members of the Sierra Club. And yeah, you know, we spent a lot of time together. We ate together sometimes, we talked together, but we also mixed and mingled with a lot of the other passengers. And about 25 of the other passengers were cold water, deep sea divers. They were a wild group of people. They were, yeah. Next slide, please. So um, every day, uh, almost almost every day, we boarded Zodiacs, and you see one on the deck of the ship here, and went on to uh, went on to went on to land. Some days we just stayed in the Zodiacs, and you'll see some of this a little bit later. So the Zodiacs, there were about what twenty of them, so, I think something so, yeah. like that, that that were were on the ship, and every time we'd go out, all of them would have to be put in the water. We'd come back, and they'd reload them onto the ship again. Okay. And here is the ship from one of the Zodiacs. Um, The windows in the white part, one of those is our windows. Um, The cabins were very small and cozy, meant to be for an expedition and not for luxury. But the food was quite fabulous. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dinner was usually seated. Okay. Um, breakfast and lunch were buffets. Okay, next, please. So here is a photograph of our guides, um, and we owed a lot to them. Um, 
You see, every one of them is carrying a rifle without exception. They were all trained and uh, certified. And in fact, in addition to the rifles, they were carrying stun grenades and flares. And of course, if there was a polar bear threat, the first thing they would do is, is use these other, other things, the, the stun grenade or the flares or, um, and before they would even consider use of a rifle. They, the last thing they want to do is to shoot a polar bear. And as Carol mentioned earlier, there would be a criminal investigation if something like that happened. We had no events at all with the polar bear, with, with polar bears. And I'll mention uh, before, while they were thinking of landing on, on any particular beach, the area in that, in that part uh, of, of the archipelago would be searched carefully with binoculars and if there was any evidence of polar bears, we would move on to some other place. This happened uh, more than one time, it happened several Many times. times. And I will also comment on the small barrels you see here. The white barrel with the red top. Uh, every time we landed, um, the first thing that they would do is put, before we, we as passengers would land, they'd, they'd array five or eight of these barrels, these were survival gear in the event that we couldn't back, get back to the ship, something untoward had happened, we would be able to stay on the island. So there were obviously uh, tents and other, and food and so on in these, in these barrels. We, and we never saw the inside of a barrel, thank, thank goodness. And, um, but they were there in, in, in the event. And the next slide, shows our everyday excursion clothing. Um, everybody got a pair of boots from the, uh, from the ship and we were all required to wear a raincoat and rain pants every time we got on the Zodiac. And underneath our raincoat and rain pants, we had many different layers on. The daytime temperatures range from about 37 degrees Fahrenheit to 42 and water temperatures were about the same. When we were going in the Zodiacs, it was quite windy and cold. Next, please. So the first thing that we would do when we landed as a large group was divide into three. Um, and you see one of the groups on the top of this mountains. These were the mountain goats. These were the, the uh, strongest and most adventurous hikers. We were not among them but they would, they would get off and hike up uh, heights such as, such as this. The next slide shows the medium group, which we were in. And the highest that we hiked was up about 750 feet. We got, we got a lot of good exercise, even though we weren't the mountain goats. And, and I think the next slide also shows the intermediate group. And then there were the beachcombers who, uh, weren't interested in, in these kinds of walks and they stayed down by the beach. And again, you could see, first of all, a Zodiac, uh, in the case of an emergency, there was one there and those uh, barrels arrayed on the beach along with a few of our colleagues. Okay. Um, the beachcombers often found debris. This would be fishing debris. Yeah, usually there was uh, not usually, but very often on these landings, there would be some plastic junk on the beach. Um, most of this stuff, it looked like were, were from fishing gear of one kind or another, although there was some other stuff as well. Now, mind you, this was in one of the most isolated spots in the world. And what in the world is plastic doing up there? It's all over the oceans. And we saw some of it. So we'd collect it and it would go back to the ship and be properly disposed of, okay. not in the ocean. Next, obviously. we're gonna talk about the different wildlife that we saw. This is an Arctic tern and Arctic terns have the longest migration of any bird. They go from the Arctic to Antarctica and then back again. We saw quite a few Arctic terns. Um, this was a, a small group of birds on uh, one of the glaciers that we saw uh, by, the sh by the shore, and they seemed quite comfortable on top of the ice. 
Next slide, please. Well, we actually saw, yeah, next slide. We saw, um, okay, these are walruses and frolicking in the water and they enjoyed watching us maybe as much as we enjoyed watching them. They were a riot. Um, they would kind of bob up and down in the water, uh, just looking around a little bit, maybe doing some fishing under there, I'm not sure. And um, uh, so, uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is one of our colleagues took this picture and it's quite nice. Most of these pictures were taken with my iPhone 12 or, or I had a Lumex uh, with a good telephoto lens on it. And the next slide shows two wal two wal 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 I can't say it, <laughs> two walruses on the beach. Ah, what are we looking at here? Huh. You can see that we're all looking in the same direction and you can see some telephoto lens and we're all gathered together, which was unusual when we were in the Zodiacs. What do you think we're looking at? Next slide. Polar bears, maybe. Next slide. Oh, let's see if it's going. It's there. Oh. Ah, uh, yes. So we did see polar bears. Obviously, we did not land on it, this beach. In fact, in fact, those are the those are the zodiacs we were in when these pictures were taken. And the idea was not to land, but to from the from the sea, maybe five hundred feet or so offshore, uh, to take to photograph these animals. We watched and, them for about an hour, and we were riveted by every little movement. And the next slide shows something very special. The guide said that it was very, very unusual to see um, a mother suckling its young. One of the guides had seen it once before and some of them never before. So we felt quite fortunate to see this. These are the only two photos we're showing of polar bears, but we did see many more polar bears as we were cruising. Um, we saw them along the beach. Which we did not land on. Oh, and oh. polar bears in, in um, the Norwegians call them ice bears. Okay, so on the left-hand side of this photograph, you see, um, see where a polar bear has been recently. Um, with enormous paws, and they they are very aggressive and can run very fast as well. Um, and on the right is one of our gloves, um, quite different. And next we see a seal. We saw bearded seals and ringed seals, um, which of course is the favorite food of the polar bears. And we also saw humpback and minke whales, but not up close enough to get a good photo. Um, we also saw lots of reindeer, and this particular reindeer is a subspecies of, of, of the general of, 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 of reindeer. Um, they are different from most other subspecies in that they're a little bit closer to the ground and have rounder bodies, and that's probably to preserve heat. Um, and this is the Svalbard, Svalbard um, rain, rain, reindeer. Um, These are what we think are Arctic skuas on the ice. We saw a lot of them. And next slide. Um, I just took this picture because it was, it was quite wondrous. The sky was full of birds. Every one of those dots that you see is is from a, a colony of, uh, of, of birds that we must have been very close to. We did not see the colony, but the sky was just full of these uh, of, of birds. I don't know what they were, but there were a lot of them. And it's quite amazing in a place where apparently there is so little to eat, although there's obviously enough for that. And the guides told us that the birds that we saw, and we did see many of these and they were pointed out to us, but we didn't get photos, are kittiwakes, the Northern Fulmar, Runix gulamat, Black gulamat, Glaucoma gill, Little Auk, 
and the Arctic skua. And there were many sightings of all of these. Did we mention the ivory gull? I don't yeah, think so. The ivory, gull. the ivory gull is only seen in the high Arctic and it's all white and quite beautiful. And we saw quite a few of those too. Okay, so the next uh, slide. Oh yes, um, so, so we also saw- um, A jellyfish. A, a jellyfish. There's, there's a piece of ice floating in the water. The jellyfish is below. And the deep sea divers would go uh, in search of animals such, such, such as this. It's really quite amazing to think that in these waters of, that are temperature 30 degrees Fahrenheit that these uh, beings exist, they do. Okay, next we're gonna go to Arctic plants. And we're gonna keep our mouths shut for a few minutes. If, after, the first, after the next slide, I, I will describe that. Thank you. So this is Karin, uh, one of our guides, and she was a botanist. Many of the guides had scientific specialties, which were quite um, interesting, and we talked to many of them. And she told us that there are over 150 species of plant plants in Svalbard. Uh, maybe she's discovered a new one or one that she had a particular interest in. And um, uh, so she's taking a photo, a photo of it and, and collected some samples as well in other places. And so we're going to go show you the next several slides of, of plant life that we saw um, in Svalbard. So whatever this, pace you think is good to show the other plants that live there. A few comments, you'll notice that almost all of these plants, I think with one minor exception, are very, very close to the ground um, for a few reasons. Their growing season is short. The winds can be enormous in this area and um, uh, they, they don't have many months in which to do photosynthesis and, and develop uh, a root system. Okay, let's look at more of the plants. There are fl flowers we saw. These are very small, it was taken very close to those plants. Mushrooms. And this is a close up of the tundra, soft and mushy. Okay, now we're gonna go to glaciers, pack ice, icebergs, other ice. There was a lot of ice. There. Our first day on the ship was beautiful and sunny. We were lucky as the guides told us that on the previous expedition, it had been raining and windy and cold and many times they couldn't go out into the Zodiacs. So our first time in the Zodiacs was to ride around and see the glaciers. And so here you see the terminal end of a glacier. Um, a glacier is a moving body of ice. Ice can flow if there's enough gravitation, gravitational uh, force and a further force of the ice further upstream pushing this ice down. Ice, when under enormous pressure, changes its qualities and becomes a tiny bit plastic, plastic enough so it moves like this. And here we see another photograph of glaciers up on the uh, left side, um, originating up in the heights on the, on, the, on the left. And now again, we see our ship from one of our Zodiacs. I think they were having a party there while we were on the Zodiacs. <laughs> right. So, so uh, this is a group on, on a Zodiac. And here we see the face of a much larger glacier than you, than you just saw. And we're further, a little bit, we're well offshore here, just in case there is calving, that is breaking of the ice and fall and it falling into the 
ocean. So we're a safe distance away from that uh, glacier. And another day, not the same sunny day, but still absolutely beautiful in the clouds and fog. And you see actually three glaciers. Well, okay, there were a few glaciers there that you can see. This, um, this, this photograph is not a great photograph, but you can see a wall of ice here. And this is on an island that called is, Kivitoya or something like that. 99% um, of it is covered by an ice cap. And it is about 39 miles from the nearest Russian islands and at the far eastern tip of Norway. We had a very, very faint hope of being able to land there in order to see a monument to a failed polar expedition in, 19, in 1897. But of course, that didn't happen. Yeah, so it was very brief. We, we came about this close and we turned around and went back to the main part of the archipelago after this. Whoop, there we are. Um, so this, this is a, another um, uh, glacial uh, terminus. And here the ocean has cut a deep hole into the side of the glacier. This is, this is very, this is maybe a hundred feet high or more, 150 feet high, something like that. This is quite massive piece of ice. Next slide, please. Um, and here we see small icebergs, I guess you could call them, um, floating ice. That is the result of the calving of the icebergs, breaking of the ice off of the, uh, off of the glacial face. And you also just see numerous small pieces of ice from the glaciers all over the water. Um, some of the ice takes on phantasmagoric uh, qualities. I mean, they're just spectacular, beautiful, and, and just, they're just very beautiful. Um, so we were, we were just so, so blown lucky. away, blown and, away, and lucky to see to see such such things as this. Um, A close up. Okay, so um, one thing that happens when ice is under enormous pressure is that the oxygen and other gases is squeezed out and the ice take, can take on a blue, a beautiful blue color. And you see that at the bottom of this, uh, this iceberg here. And Ken here. and I have trekked on a few glaciers. And when you look down into the crevasses, you see that beautiful blue color going all the way down as far as you can see. Next, please. And, and other, other interesting patterns. This, this may be an iceberg that's flipped over, that's, that's melted some and flipped because of the weight distribution. And again, a beautiful form. Ah, here we were very, very lucky. Um, there's something enormous that came off of this ice face and splashed in the water. That is the calving event that we can, that we can see. Um, luckily, and, and they were very safe, the guides were, and kept us some distance from these places. People have been hurt, in fact, killed uh, when being too close to an event, an event like this. Uh, I was on one Zodiac at one point where in fact, an enormous piece of ice fell, and we had a, a small, uh, small um, tidal wave. Um, it, was, it was maybe three or four feet, nothing dangerous, but uh, it can cause quite a bit of damage. Piece of, people have been hurt actually by the ice itself. Next. Close up of a glacier face, notice the blue colors there. And more blue colors and an iceberg in front of it. This is um, only the tip of the iceberg. The, um, what we see represents usually about one ninth of the size of the iceberg. The rest of it, of course, being under the water. Right, and you see the blue part on the right side of that, uh, of that particular 
ice iceberg. Now, in addition to the ice that's come off of glaciers in the Arctic is ice from the, uh, from the ice cap, which, is, which covers the North Pole and extends as a very solid block of ice uh, a few hundred miles south. But south of there is ice that has loosened off the ice pack or is just forming um, or, or breaking off. And we went up there. Here's a map of it shows uh, of in the red line we how far up we went away from Savarbard to get to the ice pack. And we were very, very okay. We got up to 81, we got up to 83 degrees, but we didn't get a picture of that. So this shows that we were up at 81 degrees, nine degrees away from the North Pole. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is ice that is forming, and, and uh, what does it look like? This is called pancake ice, with good reason. Uh, at least that's the way it looks. So this is, this is the ice that is first forming, um, and as the, as the winter starts to come on, these will, these will connect with each other and form one big block, and eventually uh, a, a, a massive amount of ice will be, will be, will be formed there. Um, so we spent the whole day on the ship just going through the ice pack. And because we were going through the ice pack, the captain had to be at the helm the whole time. I think that might be an international law. And the, one of the guides told us that this blue ice underneath this piece of ice was probably about five feet deep. Yeah, now the ship we were on was not an icebreaker, but in fact, it had a reinforced steel hull and was able to go through and break relatively small pieces of ice like these. And in fact, we did hit some and it broke, it, it, it broke up some ice. And there is the way it looks from a distance. And um, probably now it's frozen solid. For sure. Oh, and the um, this is from the bow of the boat, and the temperature was a little bit colder here. Um, it was about thirty degrees, and the water was probably about twenty-eight degrees. Okay, I, I'm not going to talk much about climate change, but I did want to mention uh, one thing. This this was from a lecture that we had while we were on the ship. Um, and now with satellites, we are able to measure not only the extent of ice, but the volume of ice. And the ice minimum takes place every year in the beginning of September, September 8th or 9th. And what this plot is, the plot of the volume of, of ice in the northern regions um, uh, from 1979 through 2017. And it went from about 15, what is that? 15, 16,000 cubic kilometers to about 4,500 cubic kilometers in 2017. A massive decrease in the amount of ice there. Um, this, is, this is climate change in action. And if you're wondering what our changes of weather and so on are due to, it has a lot to do with what's going on up there. And um, on the ship, we had lectures by the expedition leaders. And we also had some lectures just for the Sierra Club members, one of which was disrupted when uh, we got news from the bridge that there were polar bears on the beach. So we all ran outside to look at the polar bears. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, Carol. Um, polar bear plunge, okay? Um, probably polar plunge. Polar, polar plunge, excuse me. Polar bears do plunge into the water, but they <laughs> were not there. They were not there. <laughs> um, you can see some half naked people here. Um, and they go into the water and come out pretty quickly. There's a doc, our shipboard doctor was on the beach just in case anybody had a reaction to the sudden cold water. I had a cold, so I didn't think it was wise for me to go. And, and I had a good telephoto lens, so I thought I'd stay on the ship and just take this photograph. And about 20 out of the 110 passengers did the polar plunge. 
to great applause from everybody. Next. Uh, our nine day cruise around the archipelago is ending and we're heading back to Long Year BN as the um, sun gets even lower in the sky than it was before. And there's another photo too, as we... Um, and there's Long Year BN and you can see clearly those avalanche uh, prevention uh, fences up on the up on the mountain. Okay, now let's hold on to this for a few minutes. I'm going to be back in Long Year BN with a friend on February 8th. And um, we will also spend time in another Arctic town on the mainland, Tromso. And in, in Long Year BN and in Tromso and the environs, we're going to go dog sledding. We're actually going to get a chance not just to sit in the sled like we did in Fairbanks, which was fabulous, but we will actually be mushing. Um, we're going to go dog sledding, snowshoeing, um, maybe some cross country skiing, and more northern lights as we embrace the frigid air. Oh, the so rest of the trip we planned on our own. Um, you know, finding out where we wanted to go, getting our hotels, getting transportation, figuring out what we wanted to see. It took quite a few weeks to plan it. Our next, next we took three planes to the Lufatan Islands. Um, yeah. Yeah, there they are. And it's just above the Arctic Circle at about 68 degrees. And this isn't a very clear photo, but you can see that the Lufthansa Islands are really a string of islands with um, a main road going from one island to another. And we went all the way down to the end. Okay, next. So this is one of the major cod fishing areas in the world. It has been for several hundred years. And here is a woman, the wife, I'm sure, of a fisherman, either waving his, her husband off or greeting him high as he comes back from his cod fishing, uh, as he comes back from cod fishing. Um, These are fishermen cabins that they would stay in during the fishing season, which is right now, um, January and February. We stayed in a cabin like this, but not exactly one of these. The cabins have been somewhat renovated. Um, the one we stayed in had a modern kitchen and a modern bathroom, but the rest of the cabin was very funky, like it had been for the fishermen and absolutely delightful. And here you see wooden fishing racks. These are to dry the cod. And there's a better picture of it next. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is from just another view, but we saw these all over, all over Lafutin, and um, there was no, there were few places which didn't have its array of, of fishing, fishing racks. And um, a lot of the cod is, you know, dried, and they use it in a dish called bacalaua, which we had a few times, which either comes from Spain or Portugal but is very, very popular in Norway. This is a typical fishing village nestled under the cliffs. And maybe some of those red buildings would be used for um, um, cabins for tourists. Here's another, here's another picture of a village again with the fishing uh, huts, huts for fishermen and the main, main part of the uh, town. And just the beautiful scene below these mountains. And here I am talking with a gentleman who has a former captain of a fishing vessel. Um, let's let's move on because I think we're okay. And here is a very very lucky fisherwoman. I don't know if those are cod there. Um, Okay, the next picture is of sea egos in flight. This was taken with my iPhone 12. 
um, the 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 uh, views from some hikes we took were quite spectacular. This is this is one place where, where which was quite quite beautiful. And the next slide shows another is another nice scene of the islands and the water uh, in Lef in Lefouten. Next slide, please. Ah, yes. Um, so this is our first encounter in Norway with a tunnel. So um, I suppose if you had a boat, you could get around these mountains and come to the village on the other side. Um, and, uh, but a more direct way, of course, is to dig a hole through the mountains and make a tunnel. And so, uh, so that's what that's what this was. Uh, we went we on a, at a on a boat trip and saw some interesting sites. And this is a barn, and then the bottom of the barn is concrete. And the reason for that is to keep avalanches from plowing into the home. And we passed by many islands. Um, some of the cabins were vacant. Some of the cabins. Um, some of the cabins are used only in the summer. And the next picture shows um, perhaps we, we, the guide on the boat told us that one of these villages had just one year round resident. Um, Garrison Keeter used to talk about Norwegian bachelor farmers. And I think that this was the quintessential <laughs> Norwegian bachelor farmer. And it was very difficult for him to get supplies during the winter. Uh, so we, we took a, a, a hike up a hill uh, one, one day. And so this is a fjord beneath us with the, uh, with the salt flats in, in, front, in front of the hiking, hiking area. And the next slide shows another picture of um, of, from uh, that from that walk. Mm, now in Savarbard, of course, we couldn't see any northern lights because it was light all the time. But in Lufaten, just above the Arctic Circle, it did get dark in early September. And we were lucky to see northern lights from our from the balcony of our hotel. In fact, there was someone in the hotel. I don't know if it, it was a very small hotel. I don't know if it was someone who worked there or one of the guests went knocking on all the doors. Northern lights, northern lights, northern lights. Get out of bed. Come see them. It was only about 10 o'clock at night, though. Yeah, quite beautiful. Now, when we were on the Lufaten Islands, I kept saying, wait, why are we going to the fjords? Nothing could be more beautiful than this. But we did go to the fjords. We took a nine-day driving trip. We started in Bergen um, down south and we took and we took um, an overnight Hurtigurden Hurtigruten ferry with a car to Alisund, which is a wonderful town. Sorry we can't show pictures. It's on the lower the western coast of Norway down by the south. And then we drove for nine days from Alisund back to Bergen, looking at the fjord area. Next. Trolls are very, very popular in, um, in this part of Norway, in the fjord part. They are spirits of the underground and they can help or hinder humans. As recently as 300 years ago, Villagers would ring their church bells for hours to keep the trolls away. And you know what? It worked. This is the Trollsvigen, or the Troll Wall. It is Europe's tallest vertical rock face at 5,600 feet. And we think we have something in Yosemite, El Capitan, which is, it's only a mere 3,000 feet. And this is almost twice as tall as El Capitan. So I don't, I suppose some people have climbed this. Well, actually, they're not allowed to climb anymore after some people died. Oh. 
climbing it. But of course, people still do it. And yeah. next we get the Trostegen, they like the word troll in this part of Norway, the Trostegen mountain pass and, with 11 hairpin turns. And if you look at the lower right part of this photograph, you see the beginning of those hairpin turns. And then the most dramatic part is a little bit further up. And it was quite an experience driving this road, um, uh, especially around those corners. It is a two-way road, um, but uh, those corners were pretty tight. I was very happy to be with Ken because he was very, very cautious. I was leaving the driver in this. Of course, he was the dri driver in this. There's no way I would attempt those, this road. And next we see a platform which dangles 650 feet above a share drop. This is our first view of the Geringer Fjord, which is 9.3 miles long and at its widest, one mile wide. And it is a UNESCO heritage site. Uh, the Norwegians have a reasonably good sense of humor. And uh, this is a good example. Notice that this is all in English. They all understand that. And of course we understand it very well ourselves. So uh, it was quite funny. And we saw some other similar signs and signs in other places. Um, in Geringer, we stayed in a little cabin far up a winding road above town. Delightful little cabin, again, very simple. And this is a view from the cabin of the Geringer Fjord. And the next slide is a view from the road on the way up there. And uh, these people were farming. Luckily, it was this part of the mountain was kind of flat and um, you could farm in that area. Um, so kayaking. In so, the Geringer Fjord. In the Geringer Fjord. Um, now we had quite an experience there um, because we were with a number of other couples who were a bit younger than we were. A lot than younger. We are, a lot younger, I would say. And when the guide saw us, he did everything he could to dissuade us from coming with him. He was sure that we would cause him lots and lots of trouble. So. But we persisted and we went and we kept up very, very nicely. And at the end, the guide apologized to us and said we were very good paddlers. So, okay. There, um, above Geringer is another pass. I'm looking for the name right now. 114. Okay. Um, the Dasniba Outlook, Lookout. This is 5,000 feet high. Those two people are not us. <laughs> we did not get that close to the edge of the world. Uh, we stayed a little bit further behind. Right, but we were high enough that there was snow at this elevation. And, and you can see and, the snow and, in the next slide. And we ran over to the snow. There it is. And we hiked over the rocks. And next you will see the picture that Lisa had posted on the uh, brochure for this presentation. And notice that I'm wearing much fewer clothes than I was in Savarbard because it was quite a bit warmer there. And no gloves. Um, this, is, this is a little tongue of the largest glacier um, in, the few, uh, in Norway, in fact, on the, on the land part of Norway. And this is in Jostadalsbreen National Park or something like that. <laughs> Our pronunciation of anything Norwegian is not to be, not to be copied. Right, and this is another photograph of that, of that same glacier from another viewpoint. And lest you think that everything we saw was ice, we wanted to show this next photograph, walking through a forest on the way to one of the glaciers. And next we see a rushing stream of icy glacier water 
making a lot of noise on the way up to another glacier. So in addition to tunnels in the fjord area, um, there were multiple, multiple ferries. And in fact, uh, we, we were pretty, um, pretty green about all this. We didn't know uh, what we were doing very well with the ferries. So we, we were going down to a ferry and we saw there were three, three lines, everybody was lined up. And of course we went into the shortest one. Thinking we were smart. Thinking we were smart and we'd get on that ferry a little bit quicker than other people. But in fact, there were three separate ferries. Going and, to three different locations. And we went in the wrong direction at that time. <laughs> so we, we learned our lesson. We had to take quickly. two ferries back to get to the, to the little town that we wanted to go to. And okay. In this area, there was a, a glacier museum uh, that had a lot of inform interesting information on ice, but also a lot on climate change. Um, as you see, it's a beautifully architected building and the surrounding countryside is beautiful as well. And next we have the Borgund Stave Church. These churches used to be all over Norway. This is the most beautiful, the biggest, the most aesthetically stunning, and the best preserved, built in 1180. Designers built the church on a raised stone foundation. You can see it under the building at the bottom of the building, if you look closely, to keep the timber from coming into contact with the damp, damp ground. Yeah. And Norse mythology is reflected in the carvings, both inside and outside, because the tra transition to Christianity in Norway took hundreds of years. And we have one view of the inside of the church. And that's it, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So what do we have here? We have the longest automobile tunnel in the world. Um, 15 and one fourth miles. It takes 20 minutes to drive through it. And, and to save people from boredom or from going to sleep or whatever, uh, there are places to pull off Next inside, slide. inside the tunnel and some colorful variations within within the, within the tunnel. Um, it's not very interesting when you're down there for any length of Actually, time. Actually, there was a road called the Snow Road that we could have taken, but um, one of us was having trouble with the changes in elevation with ear issues. And so we took the tunnel instead. So we will go back to take the Snow Road. Um, here we are in the town of Flam, overlooking the Naroy Fjord. I know I'm not pronouncing that right. And you can see a huge cruise boat. Yeah, just one comment about that cruise boat. It gives you an indication about how deep these fjords are. They're navigable almost to, their, to the very end. Uh, I don't know exactly how deep this one is, but obviously uh, at least, at least uh, 50 or 60 feet, and I'm sure quite, quite a bit more. And then we took a boat trip through the fjord. And actually, um, we are passing by a little town. And we were staying in a, in, through Airbnb in a farmhouse um, way up high above the little town. It was an absolutely delightful stay with this wonderful woman who lived there alone and had farmed the land. The land had been in her family for a few generations. Another view from that boat trip, which was just absolutely striking. Absolutely striking. Ah, yes, there was water, water all over the place um, in this part of Norway. And in fact, Norway produces about 95% of its electrical power from hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric uh, sources. So, um, and another view of the fjord. Huh. What, what could this concrete what is structure this? be? I don't know. What is it? <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> ah, a bathroom, large with its own sink and um, an ADL regulations followed. 
oh, okay, why are we showing a picture of the door of a bathroom? Well, when we opened the door, I was blown away. There you go. There's a stream behind there and woods. And that stream goes down to a wonderful waterfall, which we're seeing a while in, I think, the next photo. And um, yeah, and I was telling everybody as we walked along the waterfall, did you, you know, make sure you go to the bathroom, make sure you go to the bathroom, because I just thought it was so incredible. If you look at the back of the waterfall, you can see a fence. And that is a walkway that goes behind the waterfall, which, of course, we took. Another picture of falling water all over the place in that part of the way. Okay. We then went back to Bergen and took a about seven hour train ride from Bergen to Oslo. Beautiful, beautiful ride. <laughs> Unfortunately, for about a third of the ride, it's reserved seats. And we were in a car with all these very, very noisy teenagers, but they were having a good time. So um, we'll ju we're just going to show you one or two of the highlights of Oslo uh, that we that this we is, experienced. This is the Opera House, and I will be sitting inside that Opera House in the evening on February 7th with my friend Barbara watching um, the Opera Electra, which friends in <clears throat> D.C. told me was fabulous. The, uh, Edvard Munch is a well-known artist from Norway, and this is probably one of the few museums in the world devoted to one artist. Uh, it's right near the Opera House, actually. And the next slide shows his most famous painting, which is The Scream. And there were three different variations on the screen with three different media. Medium? Media? Media. Media. Um, and they kept changing one from the other. They told us every hour. And um, anyway, the Monk Museum was really fabulous. His other paintings were incredible. Um, there is a museum in Oslo called the Kantiki Museum. I have read many of Tor Heyerdahl's books and am fascinated by him. Now, Tor Heyerdahl had a theory, and the theory was that the, some of the South Pacific islands were populated by people who had come from South America, who had come from what we now know as Peru on the West Coast. And he was out to prove it. And this is the original, let me repeat, this is the original Kantiki raft that Tor Heyerdahl and his crew sailed from Peru to Polynesia in 1947. Now in the museum, they explain how they got it. We can't go into that, but um, Tor Heyerdahl and his crew had talked to indigenous people in Peru to find out how to build the, ra the raft using indig in the materials that the people would have used a long time ago. Well, Carol, maybe that's enough for one evening. Maybe so, <laughs> Ken. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. And um, now we have time um, to look at the chat, which we haven't been able to look at because we've been too busy, and answer some of your questions. Yes, let me just tell you um, in the chat, that was a wonderful presentation, Ken and Carol. Thank you. You had, you had, many rave reviews as you went along. I'll just mention, um, I can I can go through here. Okay. Um, um, in fact, the next question was, how often are there polar bear attacks? In Ooh, it's, it's, it's not common, but it uh, happens. It happens. We read but about one a few months ago. Um, people were camping in Savarbard and a mm -hmm. woman was badly injured. Um, but she was able to be, um, she, she was able to get treatment at the local Long Year Bean Hospital. Yeah, she, oh, she wow. certainly survived and, and I think lost or had a broken arm or something. We don't but know, but don't she, know. she survived. Yeah. And the polar bear was shot. When polar bears attack, they are shot. And nobody is ever outside of, um, 
of the of the town without rifles. Okay. Um, somebody okay. asked what the month next, year yeah. we were there. We were there in August, August um, 15th to September 20th last year. Right. And what was there the were, tour there name? Was a lot of, and, oh, is someone asking a question? What was the tour name and the cruise that you went on? Oceanwide Expeditions. Oceanwide Expeditions was the name of the company. And the ship we went on was the Plancius. And um, Oceanwide Expeditions is what the Sierra Club uses mm. for all of its polar um, expeditions and trips. Thank you. And so um, someone asked, what do the polar bears eat? Uh, usually they, they eat seals. Um, and what they'll do is go on coastal ice fields or ice fields close to the coast. And if there's a hole where the seal comes up for air, they will, they will surveil that area and pounce on any seal that comes up. Mm -hmm. But typically it, it's seals that they do eat. Right. Okay. And then I was asking what kind of food was served on the boats? Um, there were always three courses for lunch and for dinner, a vegetarian course, um, a meat course, and a fish course. And one of the people with us with the Sierra Club was a vegan, and they went out of their way to make sure that she had good food to eat. Mm, great. great. They were very accommodating to her. Christina asks, what's the weather like there other than cold? It looks sort of overcast. It, it varied. Uh, there were some photographs that you that you saw early on where we had bright blue skies, not a cloud in the sky, and other days when it was was hazy and foggy. We did not have nasty weather when we were there. Um, the, as Carol mentioned, the the voyage before ours, I think it was a five day trip, ran into some really nasty weather. They couldn't even get out on their zodiacs because it was so, um, so bad. And I mentioned and, before that the, the temperature was usually between 37 and 42 degrees. Um, th there were a few times that we, when we were on the shore when it did kind of close in and sleet, but that just happened once or twice. So I think it's quite variable. And if you have good luck, it'll be very nice. If you have bad luck, it will not be so nice. Okay, so I just mentioned in the chat, we can open this up so that um, people can ask their question rather than me just reading them, but I'll be sure that we cover what was in the chat if we don't get it. Who has a question or comment that they would like to ask Car Ken and Carol? Okay, I see Roxanne. Roseanne, I'm the one with Roseanne. the background. background. Um, is that Lisa? This is Lisa, hi. I had sent you um, a short video of dog sledding and helicopter riding to a polar bear den because you had asked if uh, we wanted to contribute anything else. And do you have any other photos to share of polar bears? I'm going to be doing a book for children. Okay, you wanted to do a mini travel log after this? Of your own photos? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I just sent that one to you. I sent you a short video. Uh, and you said, Carol, that you're going uh, dog sledding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to show a video of dog sledding in Fairbanks, but we couldn't figure out how to do the videos on Google Slides. The dog, dog sledding is absolutely wondrous. Just so I I did do that in Churchill and it was fabulous. It's run by an indigenous man who's got an indigenous travel company. Mm -hmm. and fabulous with dogs and talked about each position has, you look for certain characteristics. Right, right. He's, he was really Lisa, cool. some people have their hands raised. Yes, we will go on to the next person. How about that or that? Yeah, uh, I'm Dad Luthien. First of all, thank you so much for such, such an excellent presentation. I'm I'm really impressed by you, especially doing all these energetic things. You sound like youngsters and you know really fabulous adventures. Um, 
what I wanted to say was I myself in, was uh, somewhat of an explorer. I crossed both Arctic and Antarctic circle, mm. circles, and I was uh, head of uh, ice research at the Institute for Cold Oceans Research and Engineering in Canada. So all of your pictures bring back some good memories and experiences about ice and everything. And I've also visited uh, Norway and all the fjords. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate your presentation very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Hmm. OK, thank you, Dot. Next up, we have um, Diane. Hi, Diane. Hi. Uh, my question, well, I guess I was surprised that the temperatures were as low as they were that time of year. And I was wondering, what is the warmest that it gets there? Because I would have thought with it being light all day, that it would have been warmer. Well, I don't know. Well, um, I'll say two things to that. One, the sun is always low in the sky. Um, so even though there is sun, it, it, it's not providing a lot of uh, warmth, let's say, let's, let's say. And the other reason, I thought it was actually warmer than I expected. Oh. And um, I thought maybe just at the north part of of Svalbard, we'd see we'd see ice immediately, and we didn't. The sea was 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 open. Um, and it turns out that the um, that the Gulf Stream has a small effect, although it's way far north of the of Iceland, and so the Gulf Stream does have a small effect on the southern reaches of Svalbard. So uh, so I, I did have the opposite uh, point of view. Okay. And I was going to bring not my warmest jacket, and I'm so happy that I changed my mind and brought my warmest jacket because I sure needed it. Huh. Wow. Great. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Um, there, Anna is asking uh, in the comments, I'm wondering about the climate change impact on polar bears and their adaptability to the lessening ice pack. One thing I want to mention, I was just watching videos about people who live in Longyear, um, yeah, yeah. Bön. Uh, Bön means place in Nordic languages. Yeah. Um, the, um, they, they commented that those of, that within 10 years of living there, they have seen like drastic changes just in 10 years, over the 10 years, personally yeah. have witnessed it. Yes, I, I've read that Wong Yu Bien has the most rapid increasing temperatures of any town in the world, in fact. Um, so it's not surprising that someone saw rather dramatic changes happen over the over time. Yes. Right. Um, lots of comments. Um, there are so many people who love the polar bears and would love to see more pictures. More. It's amazing to see so many birds at once, says Richard. Incredible photos of the polar bears, especially the baby. Barb says, stunning. The textures of the ice are amazing, says Dina. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have another question or comment. Um, or if it's easier for you just to jump in and ask, it's, it's fine. Um, Fantastic, Martha says, Ro Roseanne says, fabulous glaciers. Might you share more polar bears? <laughs> um, Janet asks, what was the name of your ship and cruise line? Cruise um, line was Ocean Expeditions and the uh, ship was the Plancius. Plancius, okay, and Kira or Shira, if she's Nordic, uh, Swedish, I know it's pronounced Shira in Danish, Swedish. I visited Svalbard and took a cruise to my ship was G Expeditions and our ship reached 80 degrees north in June, a great experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Christina asks, um, uh, did you try the cod? Was it good? Oh, we tried the, the um, sure, we tried cod and we had the um, the, the yeah Bacalao. right we had that a few times Many and that times. was that yes. was excellent one of my favorite dishes there great 
Yeah, so it's dehydrated and then they re reconstitute it in a sauce usually. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Well, we did not try any any whale. Sorry. <laughs> and as as I can recall, you can you can see um, salmon also hanging on the on the racks. Different kinds of fish. Did you see salmon? No, we didn't. Well, well there was uh, when we were there. It was not the season when they would would be doing that. So there was nothing on the racks when and we were there. They told us that the racks were cod racks. So I don't know if they were used for anything else, but they were empty in the summer. Oh, okay. They were for cod. Um, okay. Um, who else has a question or comment? I see Barbara um, McCoy. Let me. Oh, Barbara. Barbara um, is going to be going with me to Savarbar oh. and Trunsa on February 5th. Let's unmute Barbara and add her. Oh. Let me bring Ken and Carol back. I accidentally replaced them. Okay. Barbara, you're muted. Anyway, my, my question is, you said that you took your warmest jacket during the summer and <laughs> what are you going to do in February? <laughs> well, Barbara was with me in Fairbanks in February, March, 2020. And I had the same jacket then. And it was minus 37 Fahrenheit one day. And with all the layers on underneath, I was okay. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> right. I thought, about, is, that's, that's, I thought about getting a much warmer coat, but with all the layers on underneath and a rain jacket over it, I was fine. Good. <laughs> okay. It also depends on how long you're going to be out, like just to step out on the cruise deck for a minute or two versus going mushing with the dogs. <laughs> well, so, when, we go, when we go mushing um, and when we do outdoor ex, um, activities with a guide, they give us more warm clothes. Okay. Right. Okay. And so Barbara is accompanying you on this uh, February trip. Right, right. Have you been there before, Barbara? No, no. Fairbanks, but not Fairbanks in, and I live in New Hampshire, but not, yeah, not, not up there. <laughs> yeah, New Hampshire is pretty far north. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful trip. Thank I know you. you will. And you've got a wonderful travel companion. I'm, I'm yes. wondering about... The aurora, you said that the aurora borealis were visible in September only from the mainland, but not in Svalbard. Well, Svalbard was light all the time. Svalbard is, is quite a bit further north. And so it did when we were there, it did not really, it not didn't get dark, basically. Barbara and I, so, if the skies are clear in our four days in Svalbard, we will see northern lights. Um, but when you when you get a little further right. south, um, even at, at, at that time of year, it does get dark at night, and so mm -hmm. it's possible to see the northern lights. Yes. Okay, I thought um, just in the peak of summer, that far north was only the midnight, sun, you know, sun all the time, and then you mm -hmm. start, you know, and then it's hovering low also mm -hmm. right. by by the start end of summer. Right, it's hovering low, but the sky is still very light. Oh, it doesn't get dark at no, all. Three o'clock in the morning, I would look out the window and it would be light. In September. Now that we left the, sh we left Savarbard August 29th. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, okay. So let's see, we have um, many other comments. Um, phenomenal, amazing. Fairy tale forest. Um, yeah, like I, I've been up to the North Cape and and step. I've been on the tundra in a few places in the north in Northern Europe. Did you? So did you get to bounce on it a little? Can you tell us a little about that experience? It's bouncy, but actually, I thought that it was more bouncy when we were in Kotzebue, Alaska, just north of the Arctic Circle. That was really hard to walk in, and this wasn't as bouncy it wasn't as hard to walk in yeah. it was more watery maybe 
Well, well the the surface the, there's there's not much growth of of uh, grasses or anything that you usually find in tundra. I I think it was mm -hmm. it was north of most tundra, in fact, in in, mm -hmm. in Svalbard. Um, so most of the soils, most of the surface was was rocky and sandy, uh, with very very little growing on it. You you saw those those plants, the the layer of ground dirt, let's call it, underneath was very very thin. So it wasn't like mm -hmm. the tundra that Carol just uh, described in Alaska, for example, that we've mm -hmm. seen in Alaska. Right, and the and then the plants are also. Especially like the flowers are so delicate and, yeah, tiny. and tiny, tiny, tiny. There, it's it's amazing, and it's you know it's it's a crime actually to pick them. I know. Um, Elaine says, "Thank you for the memories. We took the entire Herte uh, Gruten itinerary cruise from Berien all the way up to Kirkenes, only a few miles from Russia, stopping many times to take." In experiences in most places, thoroughly exhilarating, even including a marble mine. Hmm. Well, I didn't know there were marble mines up there. Um, had always wanted to visit Svalbard, but thanks to you, I'm pretty well satisfied now. <laughs> <laughs> we have to live vicariously because most of us are not tough enough for the cold, even in the summer cold. <laughs> I tell you, it's hard to get a hotel reservation there. I mean, we got ours a while ago, and many, oh. some of them are all booked up. Wow! And in that too. Grass. Yeah, yeah. We, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Estonia. We could see Aurora Borealis from there, mm -hmm. also, and you know, certain times of the year, like in the uh, fall and spring, maybe winter too. I, I can't remember. You didn't see it all the time, Your you know, friend, the conditions is, uh, have to be mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay, so does someone else have a question or comment in the audience? Did I hear mm -hmm. someone asking something? Just I forgot about this. Mm -hmm. Alice? Alice, did you have a question or comment? Okay, okay. So we'll, I'll go back to this. Um, Great slides, and again, thanks for so much for a terrific presentation. There are a lot of questions. I'm trying to peel through here. Uh, Doris Dean, is that church of olive wood? And if so, is it the largest or oldest wooden church in the world? Mm. It is all wood, but we don't know about the largest and oldest wooden church in the world. Yeah. But Google probably knows. It probably, well, it yeah. probably we don't know. There wasn't human settlement there until about 10,000 years ago. So um, whereas there were humans further, like around the warmer parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure those churches are are older, but, you know, and then it's a matter of how long they would survive. Um, Janet asks, does either one of you have Norwegian ancestry? No. No way. No way. Eastern European for both of us. <laughs> and 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 many of you may recall uh, last month, Carol hosted our um, culinary traditions, um, European culinary traditions program. And that was that was a three hour tour. <laughs> Not three hours with me, just a few minutes with me. <laughs> I know, no, with all the people right, right. contributing. No, it was fun. Everyone loved talking about food and we are going to have the African-American culinary traditions panel discussion Tuesday, February 7th at seven. Uh, Vanessa Ritz says really wonderful. Um, Connie, excellent and enjoyable. Great commentary and photos. Thanks. Natalie, thank you so much for sharing this. Jim says, absolutely amazing. Well done, thank you. Mary Ward says, thanks, Ken and Carol. What a wonderful trip, thanks for sharing. Jackie, thank you for sharing this wonderful journey. And then Barb says, fabulous. Thanks so much for sharing your amazing photos and travel stories. Really enjoyed your stories and the smiles on your faces now reflect how much you enjoyed this journey, thank you. Um, 
Gaurong uh, says, thank you, Lisa, Carol, and Ken. Very informative. Hope we can visit soon. I would love to go there. And only in summer. <laughs> my, my daughter, my daughter, Roshana Cohen, just looked up the Otis Church, yeah. Greenstead Church in the small village of Greenstead in England has mm -hmm. been claimed to be the oldest wooden church in the world. Okay. In Europe. And probably the oldest wooden building in Europe still standing. And um, probably from the mid ninth or mid 11th century. There are some very old wooden churches, I think in Ethiopia and, you know, places like that. Uh, maybe Armenia um, also. So, but thanks to your daughter for looking that up. Um, Malika says, fabulous presentation, great photos, thank you. Um, Carrie says, this was wonderful, beautiful pictures. Thanks for putting it together. Uh, Robin says, so much beauty. Thank you, Carol and Ken, for showing us a spectacular part of the world. Thanks so much for enlightening an enlightening presentation. Thanks for an absolutely wonderful presentation on your trip. And uh, we could keep going on, but I'm looking for questions. Can you send us a copy of the chat? You can see. It. Yes, we. It will be um, because it was sent to everyone. Uh, the chat was made. It was made public. It wasn't a personal chat, so it was typed in for the whole right. group. Uh, it will be visible within the um, recording. Recording. Ah, okay. Thank you. And we can get the recording. Um, we can post the recording to SSTCI's Facebook pages. We'll send it out in our February newsletter. And also on, be sure to get it on Carol's Facebook page. And then if you still can't get it or wait for it, you can email me and I'll email it to you. Uh, let's see. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Hi, Ed. Ed, Ed Levy is uh, SSTCI's. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to listen to this thing about past um, president, and he is an, a very avid traveler. Ed, can you are you there? Did you have maybe have a question for for Ken and Carol? I know he's using it from his phone, so maybe it's hard to man, maneuver. I think Ken, I think Ed's been in about a hundred countries oh. and all the states. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so wonderful presentation. Thanks so much. I felt like I was on your journey with you. Heather says, I love the walruses. I did too. Um, um, Kuni says, thank you for the great presentation. That made me a very enjoyable evening. Um, Najiba, wonderful and amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, Jane, Jane left a heart. Okay, so Roshana says, oh, you read that, the Karama, Karamaki Church in Finland uh, is the largest wooden. And I think I've been to that. Um, oh, it's the largest wooden church. I th yeah, that, I think I've been to that one. Um, Catherine, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Greenstead Church in the small village of Greenstead near Chipping Ongar in Ex Essex, England. Yeah, okay. So that's the oldest, according to Google search. Jane says, well done. I feel like I've been there almost. <laughs> Summers yeah. says, how do you keep in tip top physical shape for all the hiking and paddling. And I guess it's from doing hiking and paddling. Right, exactly. right. How else? <laughs> one of, one of um, two of the friends who are on this, Dave and Diane are gonna go with me next week. We're gonna hike up Sugarloaf from the bottom to the top because I've got to get in some altitude. Um, that's, the most we can, that's the most, the highest we can get, you know, within an Without hour of our home. Region, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it, it's good training for you. Um, 
Um, Charlie Baum, our friend Charlie Baum, and you're, you're a good neighbor. Our next door neighbor. Charlie, can we bring you on for your comments? We'll unmute you and add your spotlight. Yeah. I, I was just saying earlier, you mentioned Georgia and Armenia, and those are stone churches. Um, oh, I think okay. Those. Um, but, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing about their next trip. And of course, because they're next door neighbors, I'll get to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Where they're sitting <laughs> instead of on Zoom. Yeah, I'm interested in our next trip. <laughs> well, we're so glad you could be here, Charlie. Yeah. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Um, Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. If anybody had a comment or question, um, so what are the what are what essentials are you bringing? Do you need to bring on this trip, um, or did you bring on your summer trip? And is it is it going to be um, the same? Are you packing generally the same? essentials like toiletries and i mean what are there, are there certain things that you wouldn't think of bringing like do you have to bring tape or i don't know oh your your screen is frozen right now hello hi i got wool underwear for this trip and wool underwear <laughs> and i got a pair of big boots your, upstairs. I'm not going to get them. I got a pair of big boots and I don't think I'm going to need to bring any shoes because there's snow outside. So every time I go outside, I need my boots. What about when you're walking around indoors? Are you I'll bring a pair of slippers? I'll bring a pair of slippers. The indoor slippers, for, because oftentimes they're they have the custom of removing the outdoor shoes at the door in many for places. Sure. For sure. When you go into museums, you have to remove your shoes in mm -hmm. Svarbard anyway. Right, right. Um, good. So, um, and how long will you be there? Uh, on Barbara and I will be gone for two weeks and one day. So we will be in, we will be in Oslo for two nights. Um, and then we fly up to Svarbard for four nights. And then we go back, we go down to Trumsa for eight nights, but four of those nights, we're going to be away from Trumsa and out in the country at something called the Arctic Panorama Lodge, where they serve us three meals a day and, um, and do the dog sledding and snowshoeing and other activities right from there. Oh, wow. That sounds, sounds fabulous. Well, we're going to be watching all of your social media posts. Hopefully, you'll you'll be able to share from there. At least, well, I don't you know how many I don't know how many photos I'll be able to take from Savarbard in the dark. Yeah, <laughs> certainly not any scenery. Maybe some close-ups. I don't know. Are you going to have any daylight there? In they summer? have something called civil twilight. Okay, and they also have something called blue light at about one o'clock in the afternoon. And that is what I'm most fascinated by. I've seen pictures of it, like everything looks blue. Right, right. Cause it's from the, the whiteness of all the, the snow, it brightens it up and, and it's the, the blue hue, the undertones. Right. And they like say that that's most common the second and third week in February and we'll be there the second week in February. And so the sun, right. that time the sun is just below the horizon. There. Yeah, the sun does not appear above the horizon in Long Year BN until March 8th. But there is light before that. But in the middle of the day, the sun would be just below the horizon. Tell us about some of the people you met in Long Beeren or elsewhere in Svarbard, Sv 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 um, uh, what their lives were like, what they shared with you, some stories. Uh, I think some of the most interesting people we met were our guides, who mm -hmm. were amazing. As I mentioned, several of them were scientists and um, had either, some of, a few had given up the scientific careers, but oh, there was this there was one woman from Poland actually, who had taught elementary school in a small town in Eastern Greenland. A very um, small um, Inuit village. 
and she oh. was she was just fascinating. Um, and, and 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 she can't wait to go back to Greenland. And she's originally Polish. She's was Polish, yeah. and she bought a small house um, in northern Sweden to make her home as she you know travels around. And most of the guides will spend the winters um, if they don't go down to Antarctica with the cruise line, they will go um, to ski slopes and be ski instructors. And in Long Year BN, when we went on the Faso hike, there were these two young women there. They were sisters and they're Norwegian. And one of them was, was had been in Long Year BN for three months and she was gonna stay for a year to see what it was like. And I can't wait to see her and talk to her and find out what it's been like for her. Right. Um, people get together in the winter. Um, and drink. <laughs> well, there's actually no alcohol. There's no alcohol sold in the town. They have to in bring Long in Long Air BN. There's no alcohol. You can buy almost anything you want in Long Air BN, but not alcohol. So people stock up and bring it in. Yeah, they bring it in. Because I know they're still drinking it. I know when I started the Peace Corps in Estonia, I saw a loom in the in the folk museum, a big wooden loom, you know, where you sit at it. And I told my host parents, I said, I want to, I want to get that loom so I can learn how to weave and uh, have something to do through the winter. And my host mother said, oh, you'll just sleep more and drink more in winter. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and I ate more chocolate too, so. That looks like it could, oh, that's a silk scarf. I thought maybe that was a hand-woven wool scarf that you're wearing, but it's not. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, this is one of my gaiters. We, we discovered gaiters in Iceland in 2019, and we've been wearing them ever since, whenever it's... Because your neck, in fact, I recommend you get some gaiters as additional. I have a balaclava, which covers my head and right. my neck. Okay. If, if, you, if you felt like you needed a, something additional or even just when you're indoors to kind of, it, it helps to warm. If your neck is warmed, you feel warmer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, well, hopefully, I think with your camera, that, that photo you had of the Northern Lights, uh, was that with your own camera? Or it was iPhone? with an iPhone 12. I also, um, yeah. when, when I was in, a la in Fairbanks in 2020, uh, we saw wonderful Northern Lights and the pictures that people were getting with an iPhone 12 convinced me that I needed to buy one. And right. yeah, it takes pretty good pictures. They do. They they take just as good, pretty much as the now the newest iPhones, um, just as good as a an expensive camera. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to just carry your phone and not the camera. So well, good. Well, we'll, we'll be looking forward. And I told you I want to invite you back to to do a part two of this mm -hmm. presentation. The uh, Aurora Borealis segment uh, returned as far barred. And um, actually, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be awesome. I read recently that the solar activity in the next few years is going to be very high. And uh, northern lights might be visible at times from the northern part of the United States. Yeah, well, they are. Oh. Well, they are sometimes now. Yeah. Yeah. Friends in Maine have told us that they have seen the Northern Lights. I and saw them in Northern Alaska. Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Ed, we have Ed. Ed. Hello, Ed. Hello, Lisa. Ed is our um, past president of SSTCI. What were you saying just now? Well, I, I saw the Northern Lights when I was in Duluth, Minnesota. Hmm. It, Minnesota. it was like somebody was pouring sand across the sky. Mm, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, well, you'll, you'll just have an amazing time. And I think also reconnecting with some of the friends that you made, um, seeing them again, they'll, they'll be impressed that you came right back. <laughs> so Ken, you're not worried that Carol's going to stay in Svarbard, are you? 
Well, I'm planning to visit her if she does. So. <laughs> in the summer, he'll in the come. Su- in the summer. <laughs> right. When the summer is at its abs- when the sun is at its absolute peak, about <laughs> ten degrees above the horizon, or something like that. Right, right. And it's it's difficult to be in the all sunlight. It's hard to sleep. But they have blackout curtains. But... Right. Yeah. Right. Well, on the on the ship, it was fine because we could get it quite dark. Uh, when we wanted to sleep uh, in our They had, in our they had a curtain or a blind or something. Yeah, that, that, and that worked out. And the, and the room in Wang Yubian also, would, there wasn't much of a window there. The it, window it was dark. far away from our bed. Yeah. Okay, and it was covered, I imagine. Yes. yes. Yeah, the shade of some good, right. dark yeah. shade. Right. So what was something, each of you, I'm asking, what, just off the top of your head, what was something that surprised you on this journey? The beauty of barrenness. Mm-hmm. And all the colors in what you first see as just a gray, uninteresting landscape. And mm-hmm. then you look at it, and you look at it, and you look at it. And there's so much beauty and so much color. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, yes. Um, I, I wouldn't say I was shocked or strong. I guess I was surprised at what the ice looked like when we went way, way north. Um, I had no idea. I read a lot about that ice. Mm-hmm. But I had no idea what it actually, the experience. I was out on the deck almost the whole time when we were plowing through that stuff. And I was just fascinated by it. Um, it was and, quite spectacular. How, and how, 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 is, on it. how was it different, Ken, from what you expected? I, I, I expected more glacial. I expected ice fields. I expected large expanses of ice and not these broken up, um, I, I, I kind of didn't know what to expect. And it was whatever it would have been, would have been surprised. I, I expected more solid ice actually, I guess. And mm-hmm. it, was, um, uh, it, was, it was not like that. Well, now it you was, can find solid ice there. Now I can, now, yeah, and it's dark though. <laughs> now, did you guys get to visit the seed? Um, you can't go, in. you can go up to it, which we didn't do. Mm-hmm but you can't go in. So you did go to the outside of it? No, we didn't see the outside. Oh, okay. We did not go up to the seed bank. And it has every species of seed known to humans. Every Mm -hmm. every agriculturally relevant seed, apparently, yes. And they Mm -hmm. were in some danger. Some years ago, there was was a melting... um, Ramo, I don't know what you call it, but period. Of, but and it was the entrance that that got warm enough to melt. But down, kind of in the bank itself, it stayed well below freezing, so everything was okay. But it was it was scary, and um, yeah. What was what was scary? Oh, oh the, the the possibility that that there would be temperatures that warm enough to melt. Uh, the seed bank this and the seed bank and you know there would be some destruction or some uh it would be dangerous oh so it could damage so this the seed bank would be in danger yes exactly oh i thought it was it didn't it didn't really happen to, to to endanger the collection um but 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 the the first hints of it actually the the entrance ways did melt some, and they were very worried about about that. So, and isn't it about a mile underground? Also, well, I don't know exactly. Do you, I don't know. Do you read about that? I don't know. That would be surprising. Yeah, and it's it's there in case we have some type of global disaster, man-made yeah. or or otherwise, and then yes, we can we start, start life again. Or, we can start life again. It's kind of like the Noah's Ark of, <laughs> seeds. Yes. of the plant world. Right. Well, well, great. Well, 
it looks like our time is coming to a close and we, we wish you a wonderful trip, Carol. Well, thank and you, Lisa, for twisting my arm. As Ken and I were going through our thousands of slides and trying to choose which few we would show, I was kind of swearing at you. Why did I get myself into <laughs> this? But I'm happy. I'm very happy that we did it and got it, to it share was, it. It was a great experience going back to these photographs and, yeah. and just seeing how spectacular, magnificent some of that countryside uh, and, and areas were. Um, yeah. 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 It's uh, the Nordic countries are particularly beautiful. There's like a pristine kind of untouched beauty, you know, that you don't see elsewhere in the world. Yes. And it's, it's breathtaking. My, so, my friend Malka just po just wrote that her cousin Susan Dworkin wrote a book called The Viking in the Wheat Field about the seed bank. Huh. Oh, okay, that would be interesting. Huh. And yeah. Roshana just posted something about the seed vault, but I'd have to mm -hmm. open it. At first, I want to write down the Viking in the seed in the wheat field. Thank yes. you, Malka. Yes. And the, these, all the comments that are written to everyone will show up in the recording. Okay. Yeah. And so we can share the recording with you all. Um, and we are inviting Carol back. Maybe not. We do these travel logs quarterly now. Um, may, whenever it, it feels like you feel ready, we won't pressure you to come right back in April when we do our next travel logs. But uh, you know, you have an open invitation for another featured presentation um, now that you're a pro at it. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and we were gonna do many travel logs, but we're out of time now, but we will be back with more travel logs. So save your stories and photos and watch our schedule, SSTCI schedule and join us uh for our next one and keep an eye out for carol the next time we we have carol back with ken um so they thank you to you both it was uh taksumike as they say up in that part of the world thanks so much it was a wonderful presentation okay, and thanks. thank you lisa for helping us out right thank you so much yeah. yes Great experience. much love to you